time. So without further ado, um, please welcome Smriti, our first speaker. Uh, and we are really excited to hear about uh, the spread of misinformation and how NLP can help in that respect and what we can do. So please, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, by the time I share my screen, I do have to give a disclaimer that I did not know that the talk is like for 45 minutes. I thought it's like for half an hour. So it's probably a little like I could have added more content, but I didn't know. There's so, more time for it, discussions and questions and yeah. so on. So no problem at all. Perfect, perfect. Uh, I hope uh, just you a quick question me. in terms of, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, would you prefer questions uh, during your presentation as they pop up in the chat or like people interrupt or you prefer to have all the questions at the end? Uh, let's hold the questions till the end because like you said, there'd be a lot of time for discussion because this is like 15, 20 minutes tops. I thought it was like one of those formats because I spoke at PyData Global previously and there we had like 20 minutes talk and 10 minutes Q&A. So I thought it's that um, so much. To be honest, I, I, I think it works better because it, it leaves yeah. space for... So no worries. Okay, cool. So yeah, at the cool. end. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can see my screen, right? Yep. Yep, okay. So hi, everybody. I'm going to be talking about a really niche and underexplored topic that um, I've come to learn about very recently myself, and that is gendered health misinformation. Right, and I'm also going to tell you a little bit about how I think NLP can help. Uh, there's not, this is very, very underexplored as a concept. There's not much existing research on this, but this is why I thought it would be like a useful plat like platform to share this here because we have so many, uh, in like you know, brilliant people here who can probably help work towards solving this problem. So over the next 15 minutes, I will be covering the following. Uh, topics. Firstly, I'd like to start off with the concept of like, you know, what is gendered misinformation? How do we understand it? And I'm also going to um, point out how it's different from gender disinformation, which is um, even if the term is not that well known, the concept is definitely much more, uh, you know, known and mainstream, especially like, you know, in the last few years. Uh, and I'll give some examples of gender disinformation. And then we'll move on to, you know, identifying gender health misinformation, preventing it, identifying how it spreads, you know, discussing the research agenda that is, you know, uh, a part of this problem statement. And then whatever limited existing literature there is on this, I also have like, you know, a couple of papers that are not mine, but relevant to the issue. So like a related work survey kind of thing. So that's what I have in mind for right now. But yeah, let's get started then. Uh, so gender disinformation to start off with is a subset of online or gendered abuse that uses heavily stereotyped narratives and sometimes even sexually charged images to defame women and push them out of the public sphere. This is very commonly seen in politics. I'm sure, you know, no matter which country you are from or no matter, you know, what your uh, sort of uh, background is, you all of us almost would have seen this happen, especially towards, you know, female journalists and female politicians. Uh, this is very gender disinformation as a concept is very targeted, right? On the other hand, gendered misinformation is often, you know, unintentional and it's basically the unintentional spread of false or substandard information. And even though it's like unintentional, it's very widely spreading, especially post the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and this is because uh, what happened is that with this new sort of focus on healthcare and, you know, the existing, pre-existing gendered biases and stereotypes, I feel like maybe that's why this issue has become more and more relevant over the last two years, especially. And while gendered misinformation can impact anyone of any gender, there is research to show that it disproportionately impacts women and non-binary people. So just to be a little more clear on what, uh, you know, the difference is, I'm sure I just explained this a little bit, but 
gendered misinformation stems from a lack of combination of external factors and internal factors so it's a first of all it's a very niche problem right not even a lot of people know about it so we need all hands on deck to like you know first of all spread the word about the problem itself right and then uh, yeah basically combat it i guess and me and my colleague at nidan we wrote this really nice article on uh, women international women's day about this right and most of the this at least this initial part of the ppt is taken from this article itself so i would i've put the link here i will send it to you in the chat uh, you know toward the end of the call if anybody is interested but i would highly recommend that you know so pe people who are interested read it and you know it's very well explained in that article so yeah uh coming back to like differentiating between gender disinformation and gender misinformation uh gender disinformation is generally you know stuff like this we can see this image over here and like i said right it's all something that we've seen in the news at some point unfortunately like for example when kamla harris ran for vice president uh, there were so many rumors circulating that she you know either stepped with somebody to get the job or you know such kind of uh, baseless accusations basically and then we have this famous infamous tweet of donald trump on the right and these are all basically examples of gender disinformation so now that it's clear what gender disinformation is let's move toward gender misinformation and then towards gender health information health, health misinformation so gender misinformation spans topics including politics economics health societal roles and culture and each of these right including gender disinformation i personally believe that each of these are like you know valuable research problems because again not many people have looked into this in fact based on the related work that i have seen this isn't even like a known problem especially in the machine learning and nlp space so specific to health misinformation which is like the focus of this talk some common examples include false claims about vaccines and menstrual cycles false claims that pregnant people shouldn't get the vaccine to keep their baby safe right this is all related to the recent covid-19 pandemic and these you know these myths are again something probably a lot of you have heard i i myself had to hear the one about vaccines and menstrual cycles at home so there's something about misinformation i mean i was reading it somewhere as well earlier this is a little off topic but these kind of uh, misinformed news and like fake news travels faster than like legitimate and you know legitimate verified information and that's another reason why this problem is you know of such importance even though we don't it's not such a mainstream area right now uh anyway coming back to the topic at hand uh common gendered health misinformation topics include you know abortions vaccines menstrual health hormone replacement therapy intimate partner violence also uh, stds gender affirming care etc etc we'll see uh, more of these examples in much more detail now uh so some examples of these uh, health misinformation right includes uh covid-19 vaccines cause the placenta to not develop and lower fertility there was actually an article on this like it was published online on like some news forum and then the article had to be debunked and but yeah like that's the issue like because of the article itself so many people would now have this thought in their mind right and there are a bunch of them pertaining to covid-19 right like it causes birth defects it alters menstrual cycles it causes infertility uh, here personally like here in my locality we initially we some people were scared of taking it because they thought that once you take it like once a young woman takes it she's not going to be able to have uh, you know children later so like not even infertility just you will have your normal menstrual cycle but you will not have children later something like that was circulating so yeah that's just like another example of how these things tend to circulate and apart from covid-19 there is a lot of you know uh, misinformation around breastfeeding and around abort abortions and another one is you know the stigma surrounding pcos and the gaslighting of how you know 
generally there's a lot of social media information that points toward things like it's the patient's fault like the person who has PCOS it's their fault like either they gained weight or they didn't maintain a proper lifestyle choice while the truth at least as I understand it right based on um, some research papers is that it's set like genetically like you either have it or you don't at birth so yeah these are some common examples and again I'm sure that you know we have come across a lot of these in our own daily lives and maybe even more so yeah moving on so with this uh the research agenda now to prevent gendered health misinformation becomes uh, a threefold uh, problem right the first one is identifying how these claims spread via different social media platforms and i am working on this currently but it's proving to be like a huge challenge like we know that these claims often spread through social media platforms, right? But somehow when you get down to the nitty gritty, collecting data for this proves to be a very, very, very difficult task. I've been trying with like a couple of uh, colleagues of mine to find relevant data from different, different social media platforms. And I think up till now, all I could come up with is like 100 popular claims that were circulated across social media platforms so that's like a very low number in terms of you know building a data set that you can train models on or even just you know being able to identify how much of this is circulating through social media because i'm sure it's a lot more than 100 because otherwise we wouldn't be in like you know this state as we are today there are articles in the public health spectrum and in gender studies uh, spectrums to show that you know, people, women, especially and young girls, like young teenage girls, are very unsure and are, feel very unsafe about the information that is reaching them. Uh, there was this article I read while working on this that said that every one in five girls in the United States feels like the, the information she gets is different just because she's a girl, right? So this is a huge problem. Like, because the thing is, if you can't identify how these claims are spreading you can't even like you know you can't work toward building a model you can't work toward automating it if you can't do it as a human so this is also sort of why i thought of talking about this here i'm open to collaborations i'm hoping some of you will reach out after this with you know maybe willing to work or just you know just about ideas on how we can collect this data that is also one of the reasons i thought this would be a nice platform to discuss this issue about but yeah once we can identify where and how these claims are spreading across social media platforms the next step would be curating a data set consisting of these claims and then you know obviously finding well uh, verified information and you know basically building a data set at least in the starting that is like a two class data set you know either it's gendered health misinformation or it is not right and then the third part and i i personally believe we are far away from this right now at least by a few months but it is developing robust models that can detect these claims and maybe even identify if they are misinformation or not right and Actually, interestingly enough, we do have some existing literature on that last part, but not about gendered health misinformation, just about like COVID-19 misinformation in general. And we'll see that toward like the end of this presentation. But yeah, that's about the research agenda for this particular problem statement. And talking a little bit more about, you know, identifying the spread of gendered misinformation, there are a lot of articles, right? Uh, I've put a couple of screenshots in the chat. Uh, I'm sorry, in the slide. But like, see, there's this article that says Facebook poses a major threat to public health. And then there's another article that says social media health myths are destroying the lives of teenage girls. This is actually a really nice article. Um, but yeah, from this article itself, I've taken these, right? When you go through like Instagram or TikTok, the sort of reels and the sort of content that, you know, comes up especially pertaining to this topic has like teenagers asking if they can regulate or predict periods based on their astrological signs right and then there's this myth about the birth control pill causing infertility there is this spin-off of that myth right like a slightly different version is that 
women who are on the pill need to periodically take a break from using contraception to cleanse their bodies as to not cause infertility at a later stage right so bunch of this stuff and that's the thing like even though it's not a largely recognized problem it's affecting like the wrong people right it's affecting young women it's affecting you know young children and that's not like an audience first of all nobody should be affected with something like this but like least of all young children at least that's what i think so yeah uh, this is evidence right this is evidence that there is a spread of gender health misinformation but like i said when you get down to like actually coding up scripts that can find these you know posts or these tweets or whatever like on whatever platform you are for some reason it doesn't turn up a lot of results and that's the challenge right now like being able to develop a method that can pull out these tweets from wherever niche area like tweets or posts that they're circulating in so yeah um now coming to the existing literature there was nothing uh, based on like what i have researched on so far there was nothing in the area of gendered disinformation and there was nothing in the i uh, area of gendered health misinformation or even gendered misinformation at that but there were a couple of recent papers on health misinformation and i strongly believe that since gendered health misinformation is a subset of health misinformation we could probably use similar methods if not the same right and so that's why i've taken like a couple of papers that i thought we could discuss here like you know very very briefly and you know those who are interested can read it on their own time and yeah i mean i i strongly suspect that to solving this research problem also the method will be the same it's just the data that will be a challenge like obviously not the same method but something similar will probably work but the data collection is like the main concern right now so anyways uh, coming back to the topic at hand a paper titled health misinformation detection in the social web an overview and a data science approach uses a few public data sets available related to health misinformation and then the, the authors they employ this bag of words model to identify distinct classes of health misinformation features so they use whatever you know data set are publicly available and even in that paper it's like mentioned that you know this is a very underexplored area and there is like not enough data to like you know as would be ideal but they use this bag of words model to identify six distinct classes of health misinformation features and simply put this means that these six features are probably what is going to be able to help the model that is being trained to distinguish between you know what is misinformation and what is not so these are textual representation features right relating to different possible formal representations of text then there are linguistic stylistic features and this takes into account the presence of different stylistic aspects of text and then we have something called linguistic emotional features and this uh, identifies like emotional character that transpires from text my guess is here right and this is just my uh, you know insight into this but i think that you know uh, spe- specifically misinformation claims are going to at least some of them if not all of them are going to have a higher content of like linguistic emotional features right and then there's this linguistic medical features that relates to the presence of specific medical terms within the text obviously this is like highly relevant for health misinformation and then propagation network features takes into account the social network itself and the way information is propagated on it and again i think this has to go back uh, to the fact point i made earlier that somehow the fake news and like the unverified claims travel faster than the verified ones so yeah i found this like really interesting and i really do believe that once we can have a data set like you know useful data set we can do something similar and at least as a first step figure out what are the distinct features to identify gendered health misinformation i think it will be similar to this just based on my intuition but what we might have more of right is like something related to gendered studies or something related to gendered terms because well 
of the gender weakness information, I guess. But yeah, uh, the next paper is the one I've mentioned a little bit earlier. It's called Web Search Engine Misinformation Notifier Extension. So that's a mouthful. But yeah, it's a machine learning based approach to identify misinformation during the COVID-19 pandemic, right? And they've basically come up with a web search engine misinformation extension. So I found this really cool because not only is it, you know, a novel research idea, it's also usable and accessible if deployed correctly, right? So the engine itself is called Seminext. And a combination of NLP and ML enables the Seminext engine to read a user query from the search bar, classify the veracity of the query, and notify the authenticity of the query to the user, all in real time to prevent the spread of misinformation. So this, I personally love this idea, right? And for the proof of concept in the paper, at least, the engine was activated when words from a predefined list of COVID-19 related words were found in a user query. And the really nice thing about this is that the data set they use to train this engine is publicly available like on GitHub, right? And they actually did use social media platforms for their inspiration, like Twitter, Facebook, and they also relied on a bunch of news articles. And once they had the data set, they trained a number of supervised models like support vector machines and uh, you know, random forest, knife based decision tree, all these and uh, neural networks to compare like how each of these models fared at this task. And then the results finally showed that the artificial neural network works best with an accuracy of 93%, F1 score of 92% and precision of 92%. So on the right here, right, you can see that the image is a little bit different from the other templates. And that's because this is the image in the paper that describes how their uh, web engine works. So if the user query has like a relevant word and the engine is activated, then the query text is extracted from the search bar. And then there's a neural network that goes back and sort of checks whether the, you know, the query has some misinformation content in it. And that is where it predicts the query authenticity. And then it also predicts the authenticity and displays it in like a message box in that engine. And then, uh, then, you know, the whole process basically keeps repeating. But I really thought that, you know, if and when we are able to develop a data set and train a model for, uh, you know, the gender health misinformation problem, we should definitely try something like this, you know, to make it and deploy it, of course, to make it like, you know, uh, accessible to everybody, because that's when at least I believe that research is most useful when it's like, you know, actually helping as many people as possible. So, yeah, uh, yeah, that's about it. But like I said, if anybody is interested in, you know, collaborating with me or anybody is interested in this problem statement, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I can put my, um, you can find my LinkedIn, like it's fairly easy. I didn't, I forgot to put in my portfolio link here, but maybe I'll put it in the chat if, if that's like a good idea. Thank you so much. And I hope this was like an interesting topic for all of you to like, you know, hear about. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Mm. Questions? Um, I, I have a question. I mean, I have certain questions um you illustrated the the challenges briefly like um in a way but if you were to distill let's say someone approaches you now like because you investigated this topic for for a while and you really mm -hmm. focus there if someone approached you and say okay i'm um i'm really interested in the topic i'm a machine learning engineer or a data scientist and i would love to contribute but on a technical level, what is the biggest challenge or like a top two, top three of challenges uh, that this particular data science uh, approach to this topic would, would entail? 
Uh, I think right now, at least at this stage, based on the work I have done so far, the biggest challenge is a data science. Day. It's more of a data mining challenge at this point. It's, be, mm-hmm. it's being able to identify where these claims exactly are on the internet because we know they're like circulating through certain news articles and through certain social media platforms but like i said i have done a lot of uh, you know extensive searching on twitter and reddit and even quora and i have not been able to come up with more than a hundred such claims across that is including all three social media platforms yeah, wow, that, that's really okay. So it's a data point. It is really data points point po- yeah. problem. Yeah. I see, I see. But given like okay, that's a bit subjective. But maybe we're all on the same page. Like from our subjective day to day interaction with social media, I would say there are way more than a hundred that you can find. You know, right? There are more but, than a hundred. I guess yeah, the challenge yeah. right now is finding them. Yeah. Yeah, how, so basically it's the classic problem, how like uh, data curation effort yeah. could, could yeah. In, be initiated. But have you thought about, because it's the classic problem, okay, how do we find the data and how do we curate them? Like, how do we have a label, um, label data set? That's always a problem. Um, mm-hmm. So have you thought maybe of, uh, an unsupervised way how to detect let's say in a in a label free way such type of content potentially because that's just, actually just a great some, idea yeah yeah, some, w- some, yeah please no no go ahead no yeah. oh, please, please I interact with you go on yeah uh I personally hadn't thought of that yet what I was thinking as a next step right is because all of the APIs and stuff on like normal, you know, Tweepy and Pro and stuff, this didn't work out. Like I said, I was maybe thinking of taking a more crowdsourcing approach, but yeah, what you said makes a lot of sense too. And yeah, maybe we should try that. Too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So yeah, just thinking out loud because there, there are some papers that for instance could, could predict from uh, interactions in Twitter like mm-hmm. followers and tweets and so on. So they construct the social network based on uh, Twitter. Mm-hmm. And they could uh, actually do an unsupervised uh, learning. Uh, basically, they, they were finding groups of users mm-hmm. and they could find clusters like, okay, these are the Democrats. It, was, it had to do with the US elections. Mm-hmm. So these are the Democrats, these are Republicans. They're also kind of an in-between cluster, which are kind of undecided. They're a bit of leaning here and there so it's like uh, they haven't made up their, their minds that that's that was reflected in their preferences and their tweets uh, but also interestingly you could also spot sort of outlier clusters so you had like these big chunks in between what i just described but then you had some satellite extreme users you know so maybe i'm just thinking out loud if you could mind because there are some nice uh, applications now. I don't know. Musk got Twitter, so <laughs> maybe the policies have changed. I have no clue. But in the past, you could mine with some restrictions Twitter and the content, and you you could have kind of a a decent kind of rate limit. I mean, it took some time, but so you could, in principle, mine such information based on hashtags, and then maybe decompose them based on an unsupervised uh, way. These tweets. Just, just on a text-based, like maybe a word vector similarity or something like that. Anyway, like I said, thinking out loud. Um, yeah, no, definitely. So Hans, valid. Yep, there's a question. Yeah, Hans uh, has, uh, has a question for us. Yeah, yeah. so thank you for the speech. Uh, do you hear me well? Yeah, I can. Yeah, okay, great. So thank you for the speech. I'm not sure if I understood is it is the topic that you don't find enough mentions of the false claims or is the problem that it's the claims like uh, you have maybe a hundred different people saying essentially the same thing and then you want to categorize them into one claim i'm not sure if i understand no, the thought. problem is this problem itself spans like a range of domains even in the health you know spectrum the problem is being able to identify how they spread like 
for example right let me just take an example to like prove like better explain my point uh, this rumor that went around like uh, the covid-19 vaccine causes either infertility or alters your menstrual cycle or does something to your like menstrual cycle that was very uh, you know internationally spread because a few of my colleagues in the states heard it i heard it at home so like it did it did circulate and it circulated pretty fast so the and based on how we are communicating with each other especially like you know uh, across borders like whatever geographical borders that you might consider it follows that you know the social media would have been definitely one of the factors if not the biggest one right and there should be data that shows this right so for example if i were to go to twitter right now and search with some relevant hashtag like you know maybe covid-19 vaccine plus i don't know hashtag pregnancy or hashtag menstrual health you would expect a decent number of tweets to pop up using the api but but they don't and like i guess that's the problem nice. does that make sense yeah yeah sure um yeah. i was thinking because i did something i did something similar on a very small scale uh but where we let people categorize political essentially just like anything politics uh, and they categorized it into different uh, uh, categories um, and we were quite surprised that it was very, at each point in time, there were very few uh, topics circulating. Uh, so like one day was essentially two topics or three topics, but then the month afterwards, it was different ones. So it was, so maybe if you have a data that is collected from many sources at one point in time, you don't get that many data points, uh, but mm -hmm more like over over time you will get because you will sequence them in a way I, but maybe they, i don't know if you have temporal data or if you have one point in time data well we were looking for i think it wasn't time bound but i think to that extent right the twitter api itself like the library i mean the interface itself has some time bound on it like i'm not i don't remember what it is right now but you're right maybe explicitly specifying a broader range of time could help and yeah that's definitely a valuable idea so thank you for that yeah or well, maybe like not taking a range of dates but taking like the first of every month during two years or something yeah maybe yeah that makes sense there's actually this um unofficial uh api for twitter it's called twin right and it's developed by this like it's a pip package basically and when you use that interface right let me just put it in the chat here twin it it is supposed to at least right because it's not the official twitter api it is supposed to give like a list of tweets that is like you know last 10 years last five years basically yield a huge amount of data right and when we run this uh, interface on similar kind of queries right we find a lot of content like the content is in you know the hundreds of thousands if not more but the thing is when you filter through those tweets that this interface gathers based on your search words right you don't find a lot of them uh relevant i guess like because for something to be classified as a misinformation claim it has to be you know a either actively promoting something that you can refute using science or like you know using the existing knowledge base or it has to be you know very aggressively like you know something like maybe covid 19 vaccine doesn't work just as an example of health misinformation right these things you can classify as misinformation claims most of the content right is just a retweeting of links right or retweeting of uh, other people's tweets and i mean that's the thing it's not exactly clean data i guess it's not exactly good data usable data i guess that's did that make sense mm -hmm. yeah. um Thank you. Sorry, if you finished, um, we have a question from the chat, Ronnie. 
Um, so I read it for one. I might have missed the slide, but what will be the source of authenticity? That's question one, and then he has another one. What's the source of authenticity of what? That only Ronnie can answer. So Ronnie, <laughs> if you want to step in. <laughs> Is he in the call? Ah, with regard to the last slide. Yeah. Okay, let me pull up the last slide. Oh, that authenticity. Okay, so based on my understanding of the paper, right, they're basically asking what is the source of authenticity for the web engine. So they use like a bunch of web crawlers to look at like authentic health authorities websites like the WHO, the CDC. They had like a list of like places they check out. And they see like whether the information can be verified from that. And then they also cross reference with a uh, famous like news, uh, you know, uh, newsrooms, online newsrooms, that kind of stuff to see if, uh, you know, the thing is the claim, the particular query is circulating a lot. And if somewhere it has been shown on the internet that it's fake. So, yeah, I hope that answers the question. And question two is, do you think the gendered misinformation problem could be more geographical or lingual specific? I think it could be geographically and linguistically varying, definitely, like in different languages, you would have different uh, gendered misinformation claims. And again, maybe region to region also, that's a good point. It would vary a little, but especially right now in today's day and age right i don't think they would be that different right because information is no longer contained geographically information transcends geographic borders and if information does sadly it follows that misinformation does too probably even faster than information sometimes so it would vary yes but i don't think it is specific to one location or one language no, if anything, I would expect that the geographic um, would have like a lab, you know, there is an origin of information and then mm -hmm. it spreads when the geography in the language kind of catches up, right? You, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but um, I don't think it would be different necessarily. Maybe there will be some small variations. So, okay, go to another country, they added something to the mix. <laughs> yeah 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 it becomes a little bit like that game then that uh, the chinese whisper game right like you say something and then i say something else and by the time it reaches the end of the line it's just some very different version of what originally started but yeah do we have any more um, questions Yeah, I have one. Maybe yeah, we can wait. But in the meantime, I ask this one on, on a relevant note with what uh, Daphne said. Have you ever examined how this misinformation spreads? Like, if there is a specific pattern, so does it spread through specific hubs in social media that might be bots or like I don't know, people like Trump? <laughs> so is it the case? So my point <laughs> is the following. <laughs> So consider this like we have highly influential people, but influential in a, in a in a bad way in that content. Mm. So is it the case that the trams of the world kind of like feed on each other? So they really kind of tweet immediately. So like we have Trump one and Trump two. So not to name other people. <laughs> so Trump one and Trump two. And they belong potentially to different countries. Maybe they are like political figures or like uh, quote unquote journalists and so on. So mm. is it the case that maybe that all this misinformation spreads through the fast interactions between these super bad spreaders, let's say, or is it mm. something more that it trickles down first to a community and then spreads to another, you know what I mean? So there are different modes, I mean, not to complicate things, but there are mm. different modes of communication across networks, social networks in that case. Have you ever looked at 
potential papers like that look how this type of information spreads but because i think that would be very insightful mm. that's why i bring it up i mean specific to gendered misinformation i doubt work has been done on this because gendered misinformation is a field that is hardly explored especially in this ml side of things but I think there will be research to show, like, you know, especially like with the politics example, probably somebody has looked into this, right? And it's actually an interesting, uh, you know, problem statement in itself. But again, I think it needs some starting point, like even to be able to trace, like, you know, who is saying it, you have to be able to first point out what are they saying, right? And again, that brings us back to the, first point of having good quality data even if it's not a lot right like maybe a few hundred claims that mm -hmm. you know you can identify who has said it like if you take twitter for example you will be able to get uh, who tweeted it right and even if you can get maybe like 300 tweets you can use something like a active learning approach or like i don't know something like that but again to be able to understand who is saying something you need to know what they are saying so yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah a lot of dimensions to consider absolutely yeah okay let's see yeah. more questions maybe from the chat no the reading in the chat I think, yeah, so far i have it open now Okay, so I don't know what you guys think. So we have a longer break and then we join we can, again. I would say we can have, a, unless uh, Paul has object to that, I guess we can meet in 15 minutes. Uh, we can do Sounds that, good. but just in case that someone, we can definitely do that. Just, just, just a thought. Maybe someone logs in at eight because that's what is scheduled. And then they have missed like 15 minutes. Hmm. Anyway. Just a thought, I don't know. Whatever you guys prefer, but my vote would be we start at eight as scheduled. Anyway, we can take votes. I vote for this. I don't know. I mean, it will I, yeah. Anyway, like I said, uh, that's my opinion. We can do whatever we want. We Not we want, um, whatever what the right Paul? thing to do. <laughs> Sorry. For me, it would work. For me, it would work either way. So. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. Decide, so, you're the organizer. All right. Um, so organizers, who is for eight? The question is, what do we have on our meetup page? Say what? Do we have a time on our meetup page? Oh, we don't. Oh, we don't. Then we, then we can start in 15 minutes. Yeah, okay. I thought that we have at the meetup, but yeah, absolutely. Then we start like 10 to 10 to 8. Is that good? Is that good? Yes, sounds good. Yes. All right. So guys, see you 10 to 8, like in